Okay, organic practices, by that I mean uh, a wholesome approach to organic gardening. Now, my definition of organic gardening is uh, using pesticides uh, that are approved by uh, USDA or uh, Texas uh, uh, Department of Agriculture as organic. Uh, organic uh, for me does not mean uh, you absolutely use no pesticides at all. I get this comment, I get this question all the time. Oh, I want to be like grandma, uh, use no pesticides at all. Well, first of all, grandma used to use uh, DDT and cyanide and all kind of toxic stuff you spray once. Uh, there's no bugs for a whole year. But beside that point, uh, organic does not mean absolutely no use of pesticides. We still have challenges between weeds, insects, and diseases. It is just uh, we uh, have to... Uh, um, uh, we are allowed to use certain products, uh, not others. T uh, today's lecture, I will talk about disease, insects, and weeds. No matter what you are trying to control, you have to think of a comprehensive approach, not rely on one product or one tool whether it's uh, hoeing for weeds, or whether it's uh, seven for insecticides, or whether it's BT for uh, insects, or, you know, uh, one approach does not work. Uh, it does not work for commercial growers, it does not work for organic growers. Uh, so we are think well, you should think of a comprehensive approach, uh, in other words, integrated pest management. Uh, or IPM, um, uh, whether for disease, insects, or weeds, you have to think of multiple approaches uh, to have a full uh, control of the issue you're dealing with. So let's talk uh, about uh, before you plant practices uh, for disease controls. Before you plant practices is something we most uh, forget. Uh, we just uh, till the soil and uh, dig a hole, or maybe not even till the soil, dig a hole and put the plant and we're done. But really, uh, uh, you're forgetting probably 50% of the work. You have to, Im immediately after you harvest your last crop, you should destroy and bury uh, or re pull, remove and trash, throw in the trash uh, all your plants, uh, remove the stakes, remove the uh, any support structures, uh, clean them, um, use disease-free seeds and transplants. Say that again, Boone, composting, what? Yeah, basically, where would, where would you draw the line with, with uh, composting uh, old plant debris? versus uh, destroying it? That is a very good question. Uh, some diseases uh, you don't want to compost uh, because they will survive the compost uh, and then you basically put them back. Even some weeds, if you have some issue with difficult weeds, you don't want to compost those, especially uh, perennial weeds like nutsedge, the nut in the ground, if you put it uh, uh, that can survive the composting, and then you basically uh, serious diseases like uh, southern uh, uh, southern stem blight uh, is an issue. Uh, you don't want to compost any virus. Yeah, you don't want to uh, a viral disease. You don't want to uh, uh, compost. Uh, but, you know, uh, common, easy diseases that are there all the time, like uh, downy mildew, powdery mildew, uh, yes, they are an issue, but the composting will uh, uh, kill them completely. When, uh, when you learn about diseases and if they have, if they have reproductive structures that are, that when you're reading about a disease and it'll tell you it's hard shell reproductive structure or can survive in the soil for 10 years, 5 years, 3 years, 
those are the diseases that you don't want to throw the plant back in the compost pile. But most, uh, most uh, mildews, uh, for example, uh, that uh, composting will kill them completely and that is not an issue. So, the, so uh, in summary, uh, viruses, all viral diseases in the trash, uh, all uh, southern blight, uh, stem cankers, uh, uh, those. It's hard to tell what a viral disease looks like, or to be 100 percent, you got a, a viral disease, isn't it? Uh, well, uh, with time, you can learn to do that. Uh, of course, uh, uh, we have the plant diagnostics lab. Uh, send, or send me a picture or your county agent, and we'll get you an answer one way or another. But viral diseases are uh, become, uh, I mean, there's enough pictures uh, online to be specific what a viral disease. But in general, a virus disease, you'll see the plant stunted, the, we the leaves uh, growing weird, uh, the yellow patches are, have sharp edges, not a uh, like a circular patch that keeps getting bigger and bigger. Uh, they have a clear line on the edge. Uh, uh, and and all those spots are irregular shape. That's why they're called mosaic virus because they're all irregular pieces. But still, a nice sharp edge to that yellow spot. Laura is still not back. Let me see if I can find her and invite her one more time. And the reason I'm asking is because in just because I used to test raspberry for viral diseases. And you could not see the disease yet. It was like probably at a very low dose. But when the weather changes, um, you know, we would have to do double-stranded RNA extraction to determine whether the plant is. So we have to go to that extreme. Early on. Early on. So, you know, time. Yes, uh, I agree. If you cannot see it, you don't know it's there. And that's why we'll talk about here about some of the organic products. You may want to start spraying early uh, and regularly, even before uh, the disease or insect uh, is visible, just so you can build up the product in the ground or on the plant. Uh, because it is an organic type product. It's not a synthetic product which is very active, very effective. Before you plant practices, uh, sanitation is very, very important, very important. Uh, if you go to your tool shed and if your hoe is dirty and got mud and it's not clean and sharp, then your sanitation is poor. If your stakes are just sitting uh, on the ground, uh, um, you know, um, or sitting on the edge of the garden, uh, and then you reuse them again. You are pr they probably have some spores of some disease or insect egg that you're gonna bring it back into the garden. Uh, believe me, what you don't see is what you should worry about, not uh, the white fly that you start seeing and you say, "Oops, I got a problem." What you don't see uh, is uh, is more important. Controlling weed is, is very important in sanitation because, as you all know, weeds are a host to many insects and many diseases. So if you spray, don't just spray uh, the, uh, the plant itself, but spray on the ground if you're spraying insecticide or fungicide. Spray on the ground below the plant. Spray if there are any weeds, uh, even three, four feet uh, around the raised bed uh, because the, the, uh, the bug will fly and jump out, uh, escape to the lawn or the weeds uh, on the edge of your garden and then wait a few days and come back. Now the cultural uh, decisions you have to make before you plant is the number one is choose a good site. Uh, okay, you cannot uh, uh, select a bad site. It doesn't rain well. Uh, uh, low air pocket, uh, shade, heavy shade all day long, and then think that it can improve with time. If your soil drainage is poor, unless you go to extreme measure like doing uh, uh, like doing a French drain, uh, that soil cannot be improved. Get a soil test. Get a soil test. I'm probably going to hear me say that um, 
uh, often uh, today. Get a salt test to determine your fertility needs uh, in advance. And before you plant, that soil should be, if you get a soil test, all the bars uh, on that soil test should be minimum at the clear level. Then you'll know you've done a good job and the plants are at a great start. And there are some soil tests that will count uh, if you have any nematodes uh, in the soil and um, um, this way you know I'm going to spray something, I'm going to solarize, I'm going to do something and then not plant this spring. If you think, uh, for example, your yield last year or you, you as you're cleaning up the garden at the end of the season, you see nematodes uh, on, the, on your tomato roots, then there are soil tests to tell you how bad it is uh, and uh, how much you want to spray. Rotation, uh, crop rotation is important. I'll show you some slides. Uh, here is uh, some details about site selection. If you see here in this picture, uh, the tree, uh, uh, the, even though the roots usually uh, are um, under the drip line, but the effect of the, those roots, the smaller roots that you don't see, sometimes it's twice the width of that tree and the shade uh, and of course uh, the shade is twice and equal to the height of that tree there too. So um, uh, trees in the, if you have trees that shade your garden in the morning, that is, then that is definitely not a good garden site. Uh, in Texas we have plenty of sun, we have too much sun I think. Uh, I tell everybody that if your garden is fully shaded starting at 2, 3 in the afternoon, then uh, you're done as long as it's uh, in full sun in the morning. By then, by the afternoon, the plants are respiring as fast as they are making food. So if they are in the shade, uh, you're uh, relieving some of the stress. So uh, don't worry if your garden is fully shaded starting at 2 or 3 in the afternoon. And I'll show you pictures about uh, soil drainage, how you can improve a very poor garden. Look at this picture here. This picture is taken in Beaumont. As you know, Beaumont is famous for rice production. So can you grow a garden here? No. If you put a raised bed right there, uh, that raised bed will absorb all that water and become a sponge cake. So also you cannot grow. But that gentleman, that master gardener there uh, installed French drain to drain his garden and with time he's able to do a garden like this. Okay, so location is important, uh, soil drainage is important, but it doesn't mean it cannot be fixed. It's better to choose a site that you don't have to add all that extra effort, all that extra cost, but it doesn't mean it cannot be improved. Uh, get a soil test. Um, I re recommend a soil test um, initially for a beginner once every year uh, so that you know uh, how is uh, your garden responding to your uh, soil test, uh, to your fertilizer application. Uh, in the first two or three years you can follow the phosphorus uh, trend and see if it's not slowly going up. If it is, then you say I'm not adding anything with phosphor in it at all. With time, as you learn and you become experienced after the first three, four years, then you can skip to every, uh, to every third year, if you like. Uh, for $10 a soil test, it's a wonderful in, uh, investment because remember, it is better to put a dollar plant in a $10 hole than a $10 plant in a dollar hole. And the way to get to that $10 hole is to, the first step is to get a soil test, improve it, fix it, add everything you need to it. Then whatever plant you put in it is going to grow uh, and uh, yield. Okay? I told you about crop rotation in general. When you do a crop rotation, whether you have a 100-acre field or a... Hey, hey Joe. Yes, sir. Real quick, um, you want us to ask questions in the presentation? If that pops up. Uh, why don't you type them in the uh, instant message, and if they, are, if they, if I can answer them quickly, I'll be happy to. No problem. But go ahead now that you're on. What's on your mind? Okay, on, on the right there that you had, it said uh, 25 foot or row. Okay. Yes. Uh, 
That's square feet or length? No, this is per length. So uh, usually when you read uh, 25 uh, foot length or roll, usually uh, they're talking minimum two feet width, okay? Uh, depending on the plants, uh, like small plant. Uh, uh, so in a small plant like lettuce, that's a foot. Uh, some uh, uh, broccoli, two feet. Tomato can be two, two and a half feet. But in general, we say whenever we say length, 25 foot of row, we uh, you want to spread that 25 feet by two feet width. Is that clear? We're just converting to square feet for a raised bed. For uh, for a raised bed, you can have uh, so if we have here 50 square feet, 25 times 2 is 50 square feet. That is about a 4 by 12 uh, foot ra 4 by 12 raised bed. Now this is general recommendation. Trust me, uh, I uh, you find that sometimes they are very low and not appropriate, uh, especially if you want to plant tomatoes. That's why you get a soil test and you tell them I'm planting tomato, and they will give you uh, and other vegetable. They give you two results from your soil same test: one for tomatoes and one for vegetables. Uh, that will get you uh, a uh, exactly the amount that you need per. Unfortunately, the soil test for homeowner is per thousand square feet, so you'll have to do the math to divide it down to uh, 40 square feet if you have four by ten raised bed. But uh, the that's the way to to go. Okay, uh, so even if you have four raised beds, you can rotate between these four raised beds as long as you keep in mind that I'm switching between families of crops, not between names of crops. For example, if you, if you uh, plant uh, year after year, you, if you follow kale by cauliflower or cauliflower followed by cabbage, broccoli, or any of these, you did not rotate because they're all in the same family. Radish is in the same family as cabbage. You know, a lot of people don't know that. But potatoes, tomatoes, eggplant, pepper are in the same family. So you don't want to plant tomatoes in the spring and then pepper in the fall. That is not a rotation. Uh, all the uh, chives, garlic, leek, onion are same family, etc. All the vining crops, cucumber, melon, pumpkin, squash, zucchini, gourd, winter squash are all in the same family. So always keep that in mind. Uh, lettuce and artichoke, that's new to me. Uh, um, uh, those are in the same family. So uh, always room to learn, even for me. I had no idea. Uh, I guess I forgot artichoke is. Well, when you think about the flower of both, uh, yes, I can see that they are both in the compositive family, and they should be. OK, let's move on. So here's an example of what I call a good rotation and a bad rotation. A uh, good rotation in the spring, you plant tomato on that bed. Uh, in that same spot, you follow in the spring by spinach. Well, this is two different families. The following year, bean and mustard on that same spot. All these four are different families. Uh, cantaloupe, onion, all of them are different families. So year four, when you start the cycle again with tomato, between tomato and tomato, uh, you had uh, um, two and a half years and five crops. So on that spot, what's the chances of nematodes getting uh, uh, increasing in numbers on the tomatoes? Very slim. Whereas in this bad rotation, you grow tomato in the spring, followed by potato in the fall. Well, you gave the nematode food for a whole year instead of just six months. Uh, and uh, you wonder why uh, for the fourth year you have more uh, nematodes. Bean and peas are the same family, so that's not a good rotation. Cantaloupe, pumpkin, that's not a good rotation. So between tomato and tomato, instead of two and a half years, now you have two years and two crops instead of five crops in a good rotation. So keep that in mind. Now let me be specific when I say rotation. It does not have to be a mile away to be considered a rotation, okay? Because we are not trying to fool 
the insects. The insect will fly and find you if it's here or if you move the plant a mile away. We're not trying to fool airborne diseases because they're airborne. They will go with the wind and find you no matter where you are. We are trying to, in a rotation, we are trying to reduce the incidence of nematodes and soil-borne diseases. And when you remember that an inch for a nematode is like a mile away, even if you move tomato from one end of the bed to the other end of the bed, five feet away, that's like a... Uh, eternity for uh, the nematode. So it does not have to be a rotation from one bed totally to another bed. It could be five feet away and uh, can reduce your nematode chances or soil borne diseases. Okay? So keep that in mind. In this slide, I'm uh, not going to go into too much detail. I'll just tell you what it is. This is what I call a four bed rotation with uh, lots of some winter and summer cover crops. Even in a raised bed, a good gardener should always have a crop, cover crop, crop, cover crop, crop, cover crop. Ideally, your garden should not just sit idle uh, and doing nothing uh, for, to let weeds uh, multiply. Because uh, this cover crop here is adding food for your plant. I bet you when you cut this winter pea and let it rot for a couple of weeks uh, before you plant your potatoes, you do not have to uh, uh, you do not have to add uh, any pre-plant fertilizer for that potatoes. Potatoes followed by snap beans, followed by buckwheat from this date to this date. You cut it at this date. You, this is a summer cover crop. You're only growing it to keep the weeds down, to add more uh, organic food back to the soil. Basically, you cut it and you throw it on the ground. Uh, not even have to till it in, you follow with garlic. Garlic, let's say from mid-August, you harvested the following year, and then, so that's what this date mean here. Garlic from 8.15 to 5.15. Unfortunately, you miss the window to plant in the spring, then you go for a cover crop, uh, and then uh, another cover crop, and then basically you're waiting for the fall garden. But in the fall garden, nine, the cabbage, 9.15, for example, to March the 5th, you follow it with tomato. You can solarize or add wheat uh, from this date to this date. Then you can follow in, uh, uh, with another uh, cold crop or greens. Now, I just told you, I just told you uh, don't follow cabbage with another cold crop, but you follow cabbage on that bed with tomato, you solarize or you add wheat grain, that, uh, this crop is uh, a million mile away from the same crop here, so you're safe that way. So read this, and if you have any question, uh, adapt it, adopt it, and uh, let me know. Laura types different soil test recommendation. Okay, how do the uh, soil recommendation differ between tomatoes uh, the, uh, and the uh, general vegetables? Uh, when you send a soil test, tell them I'm growing tomatoes and I'm growing vegetables. They send you back two uh, papers, one, for, one recommendation for tomato and one recommendation for general vegetables. Why two? Because tomato is a heavy feeder. Uh, let's uh, divide vegetables into th three groups, light feeders, the general population, let's say in the middle, and the heavy feeders. Heavy feeders mean they need a lot of fertilizer uh, to produce. Organic, inorganic, the plant does not care, I don't care, whatever you want to use, that, uh, uh, as but they need a lot of fertilizer. And examples of heavy feeders are tomato, potato, onion, and sweet corn. If you're planting those, you're generally applying twice the amount of fertilizer as the uh, most vegetables, what I call, in the, in, the, in the middle, the general population. The light feeders are those crops that uh, are in the bean family because they fix their own nitrogen. Okay, so you do not want to put the same amount of fertilizer as if you put tomato and beans right next to each other and you fertilize them the same way, you are hurting the bean. It will grow to be six foot tall and not a single pod on it. 
Uh, okay, so that's uh, that's why you get so, two soil test recommendation because tomato, corn, sweet corn, onion, and potato are heavy feeders, and and you'll see that the results are a little bit higher in the amount of recommendation. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Back to before you plant, you'll notice that a lot of the work we're doing is before we plant. Uh, honestly, it's 50% of the challenge for a good garden is before you plant practices. You can use mulch. Mulch is very important. Mulch over time, you can type it. Uh, uh, it will comp uh, break down, and then you can mix it in the ground, and it becomes compost. Consider staking, caging, trellising, so that you lift those plants above the ground. Why run uh, cucumbers on the ground and waste all that space? Uh, put it, at a, uh, grow it on a trellis like you're growing uh, the beans, for example, and lift it above the ground. This way, the tomato, uh, the peppers. Sorry, the cucumbers are not going to touch the ground and potentially rot. Uh, I've, I've heard of this. I've never tried it, but it's a good organic practice. Uh, some people put uh, 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 sir, uh, aluminum foil on the bottom of the stems if they've had an issue with southern blight in, in the past. Uh, they say it works. Uh, it can work, but it's not uh, absolutely uh, effective, but it, but it can reduce. And try solarization, and I'll show you a picture of solarization. There's a question here, oh, what about too much fertilizer on uh, tomatoes? Yes, uh, uh, tomato is a heavy feeder, but if you add too much, then tomatoes will also uh, not benefit, just like that bean plant. You'll grow tall, lots of foliage and uh, not uh, no fruits remember these rem you know npk in a fertilizer okay remember uh, this n uh, is if you're growing a leaf crop so n stands for leaves p if you're growing a root crop you need a little bit extra phosphorus if you're growing a root crop and k if you're growing a fruit crop uh, and fruit quality so NPK, uh, I memorize it as leaves, uh, roots, fruits, or fruit quality. Okay, so uh, if you add too much nitrogen on a fruit crop like tomato, you're going to have a lot of, lot of leaves, but very few tomatoes. Uh, here's an example of mulching. Um, I mean, whether it's an experiment trial like I'm doing here, or uh, but you add all this mulch, you are not going to have any weeds. And this mulch, a year later, broke down and basically disappeared uh, because of all the uh, sprinkler irrigation. So we spread it over the soil here and rototilled it in, and that was free compost. Um, here is a, another type of mulching using rice hulls, free rice hulls that uh, this gentleman in the Beaumont area can get for free because it's a waste product. And, uh, and, uh, uh, and he's using it as mulch here. Ideal NPK for tomatoes, uh, uh, well, I can tell you the commercial amount. Uh, um, it's not a fertilizer type that we are using. Tomatoes needs about 150 N per acre per season, and then 80, uh, 80 for P and K. So you see double the amount of, uh, almost double the amount of nitrogen uh, than P and K, but that's per acre basis. So 150, 80, 80, when most of the vegetables uh, per season long, when most of the vegetables, I memorize that as 80, 80, 80 uh, for all three. But again, depending on the soil test, you get a soil test, you, find, you may find you, you need zero phosphorus and you need zero potassium. And if you don't need phosphorus, do not add phosphorus because you will hurt your plants. You, you get yellowing, you get chlorosis, uh, even though you have all the iron in the soil. Uh, but that iron is being tied and made unavailable by the excess phosphorus in the ground. Here's an ex look at the benefit of plastic mulch. This is, of course, from a commercial operation. But look at this tomato, uh, watermelon. No weeds around it. The weeds are only on the edge where they're getting a lot of water from under the plastic. 
Uh, you can mulch with pecan shells, even though some people say it can be acidic or this, but it breaks down so slow that uh, it's not going to affect uh, your uh, soil uh, issues at all. Uh, Leo Lombardini in our department here, uh, uh, because he works with pecans, he has excess amount of pecan shells, he, he loves it, he uses it uh, all the time uh, as a uh, mulch. This is solarization. The solarization is a wonderful tool. I don't see why uh, we don't use it. It is perfectly suited for Texas because uh, for most gardens, uh, for most locations, our tomatoes quit producing in July. So many gardeners uh, remove the tomatoes in July and then replant again in mid-August uh, for a fall crop. Well, that, that window, what I call resting window, if you're not growing a cover crop, here's another option that you can do. If you're not growing a summer cover crop like buckwheat or lab lab bean, which adds more nitrogen back in the soil, if you think you're starting to have issues with weeds, nematodes, soil diseases, solarization is an alternative for your lab lab bean summer cover crop. And to be successful here, you see a solarization on a raised bed. To be successful, you need three things. Uh, the soil should be saturated with water, so add all the water you can. Uh, then use clear plastic, even though this picture doesn't show it. Uh, it looks white, but this is really clear plastic. And you tuck in the edges to make a tight seal. And if you do that for four to six weeks, you'll uh, the temperature under that plastic will reach 170 every day, and that can kill everything that there. It does not control. Uh, perennial weeds, like nutsedge, it does not control the rhizomes, uh, but it will kill all the annual seeds uh, of weeds, it will control lots of uh, insect eggs, it will reduce your nematodes, it does, n it does work. And uh, it also works in the fall. This here is a small trial I'm doing. And this is 83, uh, 83 days after uh, uh, solar, at the end of the solarization treatment on 11.5, so take out almost three months. So this was done in mid-August. Okay, I thought, does solarization work in the fall, uh, even with cooler temperature? Look at this 10 by 10. Uh, uh, area that was solarized uh, 83 days later compared to the plot that was not solarized. Look how many weeds are there. Dr. Masadney. Yes, sir. Real, real quick, uh, and, and I, I've actually had this question myself. Uh, here, we're, we're wondering the, um, the negative effects on earthworms and, and uh, microorganisms with the solarization. Yes, very good question. Thank you. And I usually say this, I forgot. Uh, thank you. Yes, solarization will kill all the microorganisms, the good and the bad and the ugly. But what is the first thing we want you to do is uh, in a good garden. We tell you add compost uh, and then uh, till it in and uh, plant. Well, the compost, you're adding all the good guys back in the ground instantly. Okay, uh, uh, earthworms, earthworms do travel and they do travel fast. Uh, yes, uh, they will, they will, they, it may not kill them. Uh, they may just dig deeper and avoid that area uh, because it's just too hot. Just like they'll try to avoid it if, uh, if it's just too dry and the water is available, but when, and then, but they will come back. But uh, that's a very good point. Just add compost before you plant, and you added all the good, uh, all the good guys back. Uh, when you're using plastic mulch rows, must you replace mulch after every planting? Uh, plastic mulch usually lasts about a year. Uh, I've had success uh, growing two crops in it, uh, spring, and then I follow in the same planting hole uh, with a fall crop. Of course, you, you want to make sure it doesn't rip or dogs don't walk on it or anything like this. But then uh, at the end, it does not last more than a, than a year. But 
it, yes. Uh, so it, uh, it is more for commercial growers. Uh, for homeowners, how about you use cardboard? I think cardboard is an untapped resource that we don't use often. Even if you have a raised bed, why don't you use cardboard and throw the mulch on top of it? Cardboard is a better insulator. Instead of having to put six inches of mulch to be effective to control your weeds and to lose less water, mulch, uh, cardboard, and one inch of um, uh, mulch, if you don't like the look of cardboard and you want to decorate it with a thin layer of mulch, cardboard is an insulator, is definitely a better uh, weed control barrier. Um, and it breaks down, and um, uh, it's it's organic, and even the paint or the color paint that's on those cardboard boxes is soybean type oils, so that is safe. It's not toxic to the soil or anything like this. So here, uh, let me go back to the solarization. So this is 83 days later. You'll see only a few perennial weeds that uh, survived. And this was taken a couple of days ago, uh, show, uh, 210 days later. And of course, uh, the plastic was removed uh, since, uh, since uh, November 5th. I did not put the plastic back on. So here is the residual effect. Uh, about 100 days later, 100, uh, you know, 120 days later, three months, three, four months later, a residual effect of the solarization. Non-solarized, uh, a jungle of weed, a jungle of insects, uh, all kind of diseases. And here, uh, only a few. I mean, this is one whole plant, but uh, only a few plants. And all of these are perennials, uh, not, no annual weeds. Uh, yes, that's not good. Yes, it, the weeds have to be done, but look uh, compared to if you have not solarized at all uh, where you are. So solarization does work. You add compost. Uh, uh, you, re you rejuvenate the soil, and uh, you're fine now. Uh, biological practices, um, some work, some don't work. Uh, there's, uh, there are lots of uh, resistant varieties. For example, tomatoes, if you are into hybrids, uh, um, there are lots of nematode resistant, uh, fusarium resistant, mosaic virus resistant varieties. Uh, um, Another idea is marigolds for nematode control. Uh, I, I, it, it does work, but in theory, you need a lot of marigolds to act as a barrier for nematodes to move into a new area. Uh, and they get really big. They take valuable space on the raised bed. So I'd rather you use uh, you know, solarization or, uh, or organic products uh, that, that are nematicide. They kill nematodes. And here's an example of a couple of names. And I'll go over uh, Syncacin a little bit later in detail. Uh, but those are organic nematicides. Basically, they are derived from plant extracts. Uh, they uh, they reduce the feeding. I guess they give them stomach ache to the bad nematodes, root knot nematodes. They don't feed as fast, but it does not affect the good nematodes or the earthworms in, the, in your soil. Uh, so by competition, the good nematodes uh, will grow faster and keep the bad nematodes in check uh, because they're not eating as fast. OK. so. Um, for a lot of homeowners, I think solarization is still your best option, but Syncosin is an option that you may want to consider as a, a organic product to control your nematodes. After planting practices, back to sanitation. Uh, a, uh, just like before planting practices, you got to remove all the plants and plant parts. OK? This is the time to check the plant, uh, roots of your tomatoes and see if they have nematodes uh, or uh, some other soil uh, rot that you need to worry about. Why do not use tobacco? Because tobacco, uh, for example, if you smoke, the tobacco mosaic virus can survive the burning flame and blow in the air and then infect your tomatoes. In, uh, in greenhouse tomato production, uh, you're not even allowed to chew tobacco if you work inside there because of the possibility of spreading uh, the tobacco mosaic virus. So sanitation is paramount. Clean your equipment. 
um, uh, the best gardeners I know, uh, and I learned that from him, he had a bucket, a five-gallon bucket with sand in it. Uh, and uh, sand is like an abrasive to clean the tool, and uh, he is oils it, it uh, the hole at the end when it's done, and uh, pushes it in the sand a few times to scrub off uh, any things that you don't see before he hangs it back in the tool shed. Uh, a good idea for sanitation, if you're suckering your tomatoes, if you're weeding, if you're uh, harvesting, if you're cutting excess branches, do it when the plants are dry. Do not do it when they uh, mo uh, moist uh, or dew on them, because the moisture uh, will spread the, the spores of the diseases from one plant to another. Okay, and when you're working the soil, cultivating, hoeing, whatever you're trying to do, don't spread dirt on the plants. And really, you don't have to worry about this statement, avoid dirtying plants during cultivation. If you use mulch, if you use cardboard, if you use any kind of barrier, you'll never have to see the dirt again. Some of the best gardens, and I tell people this to everybody, some of the best gardens is where you see plants or mulch. You don't see bare ground. Those are some of the best raised beds. And I'm going to give you examples here. I'm not going to go over every one. We won't have enough time today. Uh, but these are references for you. The name of the product. Uh, the name of the product, for example, Agriphage. What does it control? And the labeled product. And the labeled crops for, for that product. For example, if you have soil-borne plant diseases, Root shield is an option. It can, it's, can be used on eggplant, pepper, tomato, leafy vegetable, cold crops. Also, GH. GH stands for greenhouse. If you grow plants in a greenhouse or in a high tunnel, uh, it, uh, not everything uh, can be used inside. But in this example, root shield, microstop for seed rot, stem rot can be used in a greenhouse. Some of you may be familiar with Serenade. Serenade is, uh, is very popular for control of mildews, uh, early blight, fire blight, bacterial uh, diseases, and it's labeled all any vegetable. So this is a reference uh, information. And I send out a handout uh, as an attachment. I hope you have it uh, about some additional uh, products labeled for the homeowner. Uh, here's more actinovate, and again, here's the diseases it controls and the labeled crop. Any vegetable also in the greenhouse. Soil guard, if you have soil diseases, pythium, which can be a serious disease, this is one of them, one of those diseases that you may not want to uh, add back into the compost pile. Whereas these here are not an issue to put back in the compost pile, the powder mildew alternaria, because they are just there and everywhere and uh, um, not serious issue. Oxidate, uh, oxidate is like, uh, for those of you who remember, uh, uh, hydrogen peroxide. You cut yourself, you add it, uh, and it, you see all kind of bubbles coming up. Well, that's exactly what oxidate is. It's all of these are organic products. This one you can spray and uh, a minute later eat uh, the fruit or the leaves. It's that safe. Uh, Bordeaux mixture is a uh, time-tested old, old, old product, and I don't see why most of us, uh, what, why most of us do not make our own Bordeaux mixture. Uh, basically, it's a mixture of uh, copper sulfate, lime, and water. And here is the cookbook recipe. Uh, don't try to make a lot and let it sit to make, let's say, one gallon, two gallons at a time, and then spray it. It's a wonderful product. Controls most. Uh, fungal, bacterial diseases, leaf spots on vegetables, on grapes. That's what it was uh, uh, made first in Bordeaux, uh, France, uh, and they were used on vines. So you can use it on trees, on vines, on vegetables. You make your own. It's a wonderful product uh, um, and all organic. What are my thoughts on mushroom compost? I like mushroom compost. I tested it, mushroom compost, compared it to city compost. The mushroom compost is more nutritious uh, because of all that fertilizer they use while they're growing their mushroom. And if it's well composted, you add it in the ground, it's not only a physical improvement 
to the soil health, but it also has uh, additional uh, fertilizer. So uh, when you uh, and if uh, if you are new to mushroom compost, add mushroom compost, mix it well in your garden, take a soil sample and get it tested, and you may find that you don't need to add anything. Uh, uh, additional, uh, maybe a little bit of nitrogen, but definitely nothing else. So mushroom compost does work. Uh, back to the slide. Okay, we're done with now with in, in, uh, diseases. Let's talk a little bit about uh, uh, about um, uh, the insects. Where can you get mushroom compost? Uh, well, there are two uh, companies: one in Gonzales, one in Madisonville. Uh, the which uh, find which one is closer to you. I think the one in Gonzales is called Kitchen Pride, uh, but uh, you can find the name online. Uh, uh, locally here in in College Station, uh, you go to any garden center, and they sell it, and they, they sell a soil mix that's 50% mushroom compost and 50% sand. You take that garden mix and put it in a uh, in a raised bed, then that's an instant garden. It's a wonderful product. So if you're thinking of uh, starting new raised bed, you have access to mushroom compost and sand, 50% uh, by volume of both, and you have an instant garden. OK, for insects, uh, this is uh, ideas here for you to think about. Some, some of them you can use, some of them you can't use. Uh, uh, choose crops that are relatively that have relatively few insect pests. Well, uh, I planted a variety of uh, okra uh, for uh, that we eat for the leaves. We call molokaya. Not one single bug liked it. Well, okra normally very few insects like okra leaves, but that is an option. But that's not applicable to all vegetables in the garden. Uh, Grow crops at a time of year when the insect pests are less abundant. Well, you can do that, for example, with sweet corn. If you plant your sweet corn very early and it and it grows and germinates, you may be able, and and you plant a and you plant an uh, an early variety. Don't go for the 90-day sweet corn, uh, guys. Uh, go for the 70 days, 65 days. Yes, the ear may be smaller, but uh, it will taste just as well. And you may be able to harvest it before you have an issue with corn earworm and never have to spray anything at all. No, there are no fungal diseases in mushroom compost if, uh, if it's well composted. I've never heard, never seen it. Um, that's that's new to me, um, but I've used it for two years in my trials. Never had any issues. Yeah, there's maybe fungal uh, residue from the mushroom uh, that was grown in it, but that's good kind of fung fungus uh, that helps you break down the mushroom compost and makes it available uh, as food source, slow release fertilizer for the plants. We talked about successive planting. Um, uh, the crop rotation is very important. Uh, these are practices. Back to the slide here. These are thoughts to help you think when, if you to, as a integrated pest management uh, to avoid insect issue. But destroying the crop residue as soon as possible after the final harvest is the is very important. Okay. Uh, then you're not leaving that tomato plant now. If you're not harvesting it now, it's a weed, and it's food, and then the bugs and the diseases. Thank you for feeding them season long, and then you wonder why you have more sting bugs the following season. Know when to quit on a crop. No matter what you do, sometimes uh, the the stress is too much, whether environmental or disease stress. You cannot fight a losing battle. Destroy those tomatoes, destroy that garden, let it rest, plant a cover crop, and and bank and put your efforts on the next crop. Uh, you, you cannot, uh, sometimes you cannot win and you have to admit defeat and move on. Wheat free and good wheat control is important. I told you and I'll tell you again, weeds are a host for diseases and insects. When you keep that in mind, I just took a picture in the spring uh, last week of a weed 
and uh, I was trying to identify it and when I looked at the bottom side of the leaf it was covered with insect eggs. So, uh, and I have a picture of it, I, I did not show it here, but uh, it's a perfect example that uh, weeds are a host for all kind of insects and diseases. With time you'll learn which are your common pests coming year after year and you then you'll have to study the biology, when do they, what is their life cycle, when do they germinate, uh, you know, emerge, when, how many cycles, how many life cycles they have in a year, what can you do. Uh, trap crops and uh, reflective plastic mulch, uh, these really are more for commercial growers and some people say they work. And reflective plastic mulch really means uh, like plastic mulch, but it's uh, silver in color. Uh, they say, oh, that'll confuse or give the aphids and thrips a headache and they'll fly away. Some people say it works, some people say it doesn't work. That's really not for the homeowner. Um, this is an example of a viral tomato. You see it's stunted, weak, compared to its uh, sister uh, of the same age or just right, ne right next to it. Look at the leaves, they're twisted, they look all funny. They, they, this is when you say, I, I got to quit on this, there's nothing I can do. Besides it's a viral, there's nothing I can do or nothing I can spray to fix it. So you pull it out and you throw it away in the trash. This uh, viral plants are the ones you don't want to add back in the, in the uh, uh, compost pile. Trap crops. Well, did you know that white eggplants attracts Colorado potato beetles and uh, more, uh, um, more than uh, even the regular eggplants or tomato plants. So if you can plant a one white eggplant as a as a sacrifice plant to attract all the Colorado potato beetles and some other uh, feeding uh, pests. And then when you see, when you see it full, uh, when you see it full, uh, you just throw a cover, a plastic bag and trap all those bugs and, uh, and control it that way. Question here on Colorado potato beetle on Chinese cabbage, uh, control options, well, um, I'll show you some example of products here that you can uh, use and are uh, organic and you, um, um, of course uh, BT is uh, one of them uh, as long as you spray it uh, when the beetles uh, are at the larva stage. Uh, when they are adult, BT does not work. Another example, collards attract diamondback moth. So if you plant collards right next to your cabbage as a sacrifice crop or as a trap crop, then you can, uh, you uh, protect your, your cabbage. Dill repels tomato hornworms. Um, some people say it adds flavor to the tomato. Uh, I don't think it's true, but uh, hey, dill is another herb that you can eat, so why not plant it and uh, by the smell of it repel the tomato hornworms. Okay, and some other options here. Um, use physical exclusion methods and I'll show you a picture of some cover uh, of the matted row covers. They're a wonderful tool to use. Monitor your pest population. That's why you should be in the garden regularly, not just when you have a job to do. Just check your garden in the morning. See if there's a bug or two um, um, or, uh, or a weed or two or a spot of disease and how day after day is that spot getting bigger and worse. Keep records. Really a good gardener keeps records of what they are doing so that in the winter when they have uh, a break they can look at their notes and see what bugs, what bug uh, gave them a lot of trouble so they need to learn more about it or, or buy a different insecticide or plant a different crop. You got to keep learning. Okay, there was a question about is it organic to use uh, patented plants as opposed to orga heirloom plants. Uh, it is okay to use uh, patented plants, I guess you mean hybrids. It is okay to use hybrids uh, as long as they are grown in a organic soil, in an organic operation and, uh, and some states maybe even state that even the seeds have to be organic. So even the hybrid seed that you buy from Johnny's, for example, 
has to be organic and then it's uh, it's okay it does not have to be heirloom plant uh, to qualify as a uh, as a in an organic operation GMO plants are absolutely no no Gen GMO stands for genetically modified organism they uh, uh, with artificial engineering they added some genes from different uh, from bacteria from uh, fungi from insects to give it a so those are definitely not accepted in in, in a certified organic operation okay Adding beneficial insects such as ladybugs, that is absolutely uh, one of the um, um, tools at your disposal. Uh, Trichogamma wasps are, uh, are another example. Uh, you know, they are great. Um, um, it's a great tool to have, absolutely. Um, you can buy... Uh, uh, Sting lady beetles. You can buy uh, wasps, uh, uh, lady, uh, lace wing, uh, uh, lay, lace wing beetle. All those uh, lace wing insects. All those GMOs are required to be labeled. Yes, GMO plants are required to be labeled. So uh, if they're not, you can sue somebody and, and make a lot of money. Okay, here's an example of what I'm calling exclusion, physical exclusion method. This is nothing but a matted draw cover. A brand name is called Agribon or Rime. Uh, these are two brand names. Uh, in the spring, if you add it, it gives it a little bit of extra warmth uh, so the plant can germinate and be protected from light freeze overnight. If you plant a fall crop, like they're planting here, broccoli or cabbage, looks like broccoli or cabbage, even in the summer you plant it, those plants, uh, uh, you can reduce the heat stress in a 100 degree day in September or mid-August, uh, and a physical barrier against all the insects that are crawling around in mid-summer and they will love to eat your tender plants. So whether in a long row like this or in a 4x4 four four square bed, you can build your own frame and throw that over it and put it for like a week or two. It's not going to stress the plant. This is not a solid white barrier. The light will go through it. It will cut out maybe 30% of the light, but those young plants don't need all that excess light in the middle of the heat of summer. And... Uh, and uh, so that's what I mean. That's a perfect example of uh, ex, uh, a physical barrier to reduce stress of the plant. Do yellowing leaves attract in insects? In general, sick plant two things attracts diseases or insects: sick plants and uh, over fertilized plants. Uh, sick plant. I have a picture uh, of a squash plant that was sick at planting and continued to be sick and in midsummer it was covered with squash bugs while the one right next to it and the leaves were touching each other that was a healthy plant there were no squash bugs on it um, uh, so that because it was a sick plant at the same time if you add excess nitrogen fertilizer we call it oh that leaves is sweet it tastes sweet to the bugs it attracts insects because it tastes sweet to them and uh, compared to norm, uh, plants normally fertilized. Okay, again, um, I'm going to go over some uh, examples that are in a little bit uh, specific. Uh, spinosad, it's pronounced as spinosad, is a wonderful organic product uh, on thrips, white flies, leaf miners, a lot of caterpillars. Uh, so your uh, question on Colorado potato beetles, spinosad is an example here. Uh, Entrust is an organic formulation and it also comes in a organic fire and bait. Justice and green light fire and bait are example of uh, baits that you sprinkle on the mound and uh, kill the fire ants in an organic operation. Spinosad is, is a wonderful product. BT is uh, uh, tried and tested. Basically, you are spraying a bacteria that once the caterpillar eats it, uh, it'll uh, get sick, uh, get a stomach ache, stop eating, and eventually die. Uh, so you're using one organisms uh, to use another organisms. Uh, 
Um, spinosad is biological. Uh, yes, it is. Uh, uh, some formulation are organic. Uh, others are not organic. So make sure you look at the label that it uh, has the organic symbol. But spinosad is derived from fermentation of uh, organisms that are found in the soil. So uh, that is a, a organic option. Keep in mind that Bt. There are different strains of Bt. Uh, so some work on some. Uh, pests, uh, other work on some other pests. So for example, if you have beetles, you may want to work uh, with Bt tenebrionis versus uh, just Bt azawi, azawi, which can work only on caterpillars. Okay? And this is an example where, uh, and this is true for all organic products, uh, especially uh, the organic products, because they're slow active, you may want to start spraying uh, before uh, you see the problem. Okay? And that's where your notes that you kept from the year before, if you have a note that I saw the first, um, you know, um, mosquito or caterpillar or beetle on this date, I'm going to start spraying a week and then continue spraying every seven to ten days uh, to avoid that issue. That's what I told you, keep in notes and keep learning is important. And here's a perfect example where it can be used. And this is an example of organic products and names of different products that have BT in them. Javelin, Dipel, Delphin, Del Deliver, etc., etc., etc. Neem oil is basically an oil like a vegetable oil. It's taken from uh, a evergreen tree um, and extracted. And it is like, uh, if you're familiar with summer oils, uh, commercial grower use, or horticultural oils, it basically works the same way. You coat, when you spray it, you coat that insect with that oil. It's sticky. Uh, or the diseases, it uh, blocks the air, it, it oxygen exchange. Um, and uh, they suffocate and die. Oil, like I said, is an oil, so make sure you spray it on soft-bodied insect. If you spray it on a beetle, it will just bounce off its uh, hard shell and do nothing. And here's example of organic products, Trilogy, neem oil, and 70% neem oil, etc. Now, are you familiar with azadirectin? Azadirectin is the purified form of neem oil. Because what is the name of the neem tree? It's Azadirecta indica. So, you, so when you take the neem oil, which is a mixture of all kinds of fatty acids, and you pur purify it, they find that this one uh, product is very active. And uh, this is, uh, and they named it after the scientific name of the tree. So azadirectin basically is the purified form of neem oil. Uh, it's a little bit more effective because it's purified. Uh, but again, it's slow acting like any other organic product. You want to apply it uh, um, early on when the population of, uh, of the disease or insect is low and apply regularly. And here's an example of some organic products. Okay, next slide. I'm uh, on Bovaria bassiana. This is uh, similar to a, the principle of Bt. Bt is a bacteria that you feed it to the insect and you make it sick. Bovaria is a fungal disease that only attacks uh, insects. It is safe for people. It is safe for plants. It's not going to cause a fungal disease on, on you or on the plants. But when you apply it, the insect gets sick, uh, uh, like white flies, thrips, aphids. Like I told you, it is uh, all of them are slow acting. So please spray early and spray regularly. And if you think organic production means uh, very few disease, very few sprays, you are uh, mis uh, you are uh, mistaken. Like I said, 
uh, organic, uh, the best organic producers uh, probably spray more often than commercial growers. And just for the fact that those organic products don't have all the additives added to them, artificial additives, so that they stick and last a long time. So any little bit of rain, it washes it away, they have to come back and spray again. So please, organic production does not mean no spray at all, number one, and it does not mean a spray as little as possible. And here's an example, Mycotrol, I hear more and more good news about Mycotrol uh, uh, because we have white fly strips and aphids. I encourage everybody uh, to try it and confirm the... Uh, uh, what I'm hearing uh, on the phone from organic growers that they like it. I'll be interested to hear your personal experience. Dr. Masadney. Yes, sir. Real quick on that one. We've been, uh, about the last two years, we've been we've been uh, beat up pretty hard with, with uh, leaf-footed bugs. Yes. Does that have any control on them? No, not really, um, uh, because those are uh, sucking insects. So they are feeding inside the fruit. They are not eating on the surface. So yes, you can spray it, uh, but uh, it's not going to uh, eat where that spray is. You see what I mean? Uh, because they, uh, they feed inside the fruit and not where. They don't uh, chew the leaf or chew the fruit. They, so it's not, I, I doubt it will work. Okay, viruses, there are viruses available. So you, with bacteria, Bt, fungi, mycotrol, and there are viruses that you can use in your arsenal to control uh, some worms. Okay, so SPOD XLC, uh, you can use it to control beet worm. Gemstar LC, you can use it for corn earworm, which is the exactly the same uh, the insect as the tomato fruit worm. So if you have corn earworm, that uh, you will you will see its cousin or the same one on your tomatoes, eating and chewing and inside your tomato fruit, and it is then called tomato fruit worm and tobacco bud worm only. So if you have this issue year after year, you may want to consider this. You spray a virus again; it's a virus only specific for these insects. It is safe for people. It is safe for uh, plants. Uh, nematodes, there are good nematodes that uh, uh, attack insects. They're called entomopathological nematodes. The uh, nematodes, all they do is hunt and attack in, and trap insect eggs or insect uh, uh, larvae in the ground and they kill them. Okay, uh, so those are good for anything that g goes in the ground, uh, like squash, vine border, crickets, white grubs, cutworms. Uh, so you know have to you, uh, applying it early enough uh, and regularly and right conditions is the trick to, for it to work. And here's example of two types, uh, two names. I'm not gonna pronounce them uh, uh, that are effective. The viral controls, are they just preventative? Uh, no, you are spraying early before the problem, so you build up your population of virus, uh, but uh, basically you're killing the, the insect as it is, uh, as uh, the insect appear. Can they be tank picks? Uh, I'm not sure, I don't, I've never used them. Uh, I will refer you to the label to tell you. Uh, sometimes you cannot mix it with anything else because it can be inactivated. Uh, so more than likely, no with organic product, but check the label. Uh, pyrethrin is a very uh, popular uh, broad spectrum insecticide. Um, um, uh, I use it on my fire ants. I use it uh, all over, all the time. It is short-lived. It does not last a long time. Many difficult insects. You wonder why your sting bugs uh, are not controlled. Well, even if you control 10% of them, or they get sick and they come, they recover and they grow back. Okay, Laura, I am on the slide that says pyrethrin uh, right now. Uh, um, I, uh, uh, I'm talking about pyrethrin. 
Okay, now be careful with pyrethrin. Uh, just because the active ingredient is pyrethrin, it doesn't mean it is organic. So, and the chemical company will print anything to sell you the product. For example, if it has a synergist or if on the label you see PBO, then that is not uh, uh, organic. Uh, then that product is not organic. Okay? Pyganic is a formulation of pyrethrin that is organic. Huh? Very clever name. Pi is for pyrethrin and ganic from organic. So just because it has pyrethrin, or uh, the, and this applies to any other product, just because it has uh, BT, it doesn't mean it's organic. And make sure it also says organic, because they may have other additives uh, that are not certified as organic. Here, and here's an example of rotenone and pyrethrin. Both of them by themselves are organic, but when you mix them, uh, the formulation is pyrelin. Well, pyrelin is wonderful. It controls sting bugs, squash bugs, cucumber beetles, vegetable weevils, and other pests. But so far, pyrelin is not approved as an organic product. If that is important to you, then you cannot use pyrelin. Um, even though the two active ingredients by themselves, if you apply them separately, uh, can be organic options. Oh, sorry, um, uh, Laura, I just finished the slide, rotten on and pyrethrin. Um, uh, and, uh, and I was just saying that pyrelin, which is the mix of rotten on and pyrethrin, is not organic even though rotenone by itself and pyrethrin by itself applied are organic. Next slide is plant extract products. You hear more and more about uh, plant extract product like garlic spray, cinnamon uh, oil, clove oil, uh, lots of products available just because they are uh, garlic derivative or cinnamon derivative. It does not mean that they are organic. Uh, so far, some of these uh, products are not certified organic, okay? So uh, read the label caref carefully, which is a recommendation uh, uh, good for any, any time of the year or for any product. Okay, so cinnamite, which is an example of a miticide that controls your mites, and it's an extract from cinnamon oil, right? It's a wonderful product, but then you think it's organic, it's extract from uh, cinnamon oil, but uh, it uh, uh, currently, right now, it is not uh, organically approved. Next slide is iron phosphate. Uh, for example, sluggo, if you're familiar with the slug or snail bait, it's nothing but iron phosphate. So if your soil is uh, slow, is weak, is uh, if your soil is poor in iron, you can use iron phosphate to control your slug or snail bait and add a little bit more iron uh, to your ground. Okay, and this one is an organic uh, uh, certified product. Next slide is horticultural oils. I gave you a couple of examples of horticultural oils, like neem oil. Um, horticultural oil are derived from different plants, different products. Um, but uh, most of them are not organic because of the additives or the emulsifiers they are, that are mixed with them. Okay. If you see a horticultural oil and you look at the ingredients and it says the emulsifier is BVA spray 10 or organic JMS stylet oil, those are organic emulsifiers and then the whole product, the whole uh, the horticultural oil is organic certified. Okay, so knowledge is power, keep those two names in mind, those are organic emulsifiers. Uh, are common liquid soap sprays considered organic? Uh, depends on the active ingredient. If uh, the BVA spray is one of the emulsifier uh, and uh, it's neem oil or something else added to it, then yes. It's not, uh, tr I cannot say yes or no. Uh, 
uh, wholesale for all the uh, liquid soap sprays, okay? You'll have to see what's the active ingredient. Uh, you mention uh, Boone like dial. Uh, I don't recommend people to make their own formulation of liquid soap uh, sprays. Uh, all I see is injury uh, because uh, people don't know how to make the right concentration and they add too much soap. Uh, and what does soap do? It washes off the grease off your hands, right? Well, soap also washes off the wax of, on the leaf, on the leaves of the plant, removes that waxy protection, and the plants uh, desiccate, dries out, and, and, and wilts and dies. So unless you're an expert at it and you've tried it and know how to do it, uh, be very careful trying to make your own liquid soap uh, mixture. What about Sucre Shield? Sucre Shield is an insecticide. I did not talk about it. I did buy it. I passed it around to some of my organic uh, growers. It is basically a derivative of uh, uh, from sugar. Uh, and, you know, uh, some people swear by it uh, and others said uh, it didn't work. I don't know what to tell you. Uh, what uh, what to tell you unless you try it yourself? Uh, maybe those uh, that said it didn't work, they didn't know didn't know how to apply it or applied it at the wrong time. Uh, but uh, it's not expensive; it's worth trying, and it is organic. What BT products for mosquitoes are organic? There's lots of BT products that are organic. You just have to look at the label. Uh, you have to look at the label uh, and make sure it says uh, organic. Uh, but in general, most of them are, uh, unless they add some other uh, form, uh, the emulsifier or adjuvant that are not. Like I said, Sucrashield, I did not try Sucrashield. I gave it uh, to my uh, growers, and some of them said it's wonderful, and others said it didn't work. Uh, my feeling is that it should work uh, if you use it at the right uh, uh, formulation and at the right time, because there's always the human error. Uh, next slide is vegetable oil and fish oils. Here's an example of uh, vegetable oil. Basically, it's like neem oil, but uh, the uh, golden pest derived from soybean, vegol, vegol year, I don't know how to pronounce it, organocide mixture of fish oil and sesame. And just because it's a vegetable oil, fish oil, like I, I keep saying this over and over again, please read the label carefully. It may not be organic. Because if you are certified organic and you apply one of these and it's not organic, you ruined your certification for three years. Okay, so read the label carefully. And just because it's an extract, uh, a vegetable oil or plant extract or fish oil extract or this, it does not mean that they are 100% organic. Next slide, and this back to your question, uh, Boone, insecticidal soap. Uh, it can... <laughs> it can. Is lime really organic considering some sources? Uh, yes, lime uh, so far, uh, even though it is crushed and uh, if there's nothing added to it, even though it's mined and crushed and processed, it is still considered organic, um, uh, organic uh, product. Okay, back to the insecticidal soap. They can cause foliar injury, like I told you, if you apply at a high concentration because you're basically washing off the wax on the leaves that protects the plant from drying, so it dries out, desiccates, and dies. So be careful. Okay, uh, some examples are uh, um, uh, MP, MPED and safer insect killing soap concentrate. So please uh, buy the product for five ten dollar. Don't mix your own recipe. Uh, yeah. uh, if you know how to do it and you've been successful, t uh, teach me because I haven't. Uh, uh, I don't have. I'm not willing to try it and hurt my plants. 
Next slide is sulfur. Sulfur has many uses. It's a uh, it's uh, controls spider mites, control diseases. Uh, it's if you spray it in the soil and you mix it in two or three months in advance, it can lower your pH. So if your soil pH is high, uh, powdered sulfur is a tool you can use also to lower your soil pH. Uh, in addition to any fungal diseases and spider mites and all this. Okay, um, be careful when you're working with uh, powdered sulfur because it can get into your eye and even though it's organic, it can get in your eye and when the water in your eye, it will uh, turn into diluted sulfuric acid and that's why, uh, you, you, you know, you, uh, that's why you cry when you're cutting onion because of similar products that containing, uh, that contain sulfur. Okay, and uh, Thiolux, Microsol, and Sulfur DF are examples of product uh, that uh, that uh, are uh, can, that contain sulfur in them. Next, uh, next slide is kaolin clay. Uh, kaolin clay, when you spray it, it looks like you white uh, you sprayed whitewash on your plants. Okay, basically it is uh, a physical barrier. It, uh, some people spray it to reduce heat stress. Uh, I, I, my tomato grower, commercial growers, they use it to spray, uh, to, uh, they use a paint, uh, like a paintbrush, and they, and they uh, splash it on the tomatoes that are exposed, that are not covered by the foliage so they don't get sunburn, oh, and on peppers, same thing. It's an organic product, it can be applied uh, uh, and it also, uh, because it's like a thin coat of clay, the bugs are not going to enjoy, the feeding insects are not going to enjoy uh, eating through it or eating it to reach the foliage below it. So it's like a physical barrier type of insect management. And Surround is a product that's uh, uh, made out of kaolin clay. I recommend you, you try it uh, um, and it's organically approved. But of course, when you spray it, the plant look white. So if you want to take a picture of a white uh, tomato and call it Christmas in July, uh, kaolin clay, uh, Surround WP is your, is your product. Uh, by, I meant by Christmas in July, meaning like a Christmas tree covered with snow. Next slide, I'm going to talk briefly about uh, about organic herbicide. Kale and clay, could it be used as a sunscreen? Yes, I just told you that uh, you can spray, you can uh, you can use a paintbrush and and splash it on exposed fruits like pepper and tomato, eggplants, uh, and uh, it is then as a sunscreen uh, to, to, uh, to stop sunburn on those sensitive uh, vegetables. Yes. And it easily washes, washes out with water or a little bit of water and vinegar and it can wash, uh, wash off the kale and clay off those tomatoes, pepper, eggplants, whatever you want, you're eating and, uh, <coughs> and eat them then. Organic herbicides, they are mostly pre-emerged type uh, herbicides. Now, I think you may have heard that 20% uh, that, uh, vinegar works. Uh, Green Match uh, is another product which is a limonene citrus type derivative. They say it's a, a have post-emergence uh, activity, but in general, the one that are most effective uh, uh, most effective as pre-emergence. There's a question, are there benefits to weeds to the soil? No, there are no benefits to the weeds. Uh, the only benefit, let me take that back, the only benefit is that if you disc them under, then those weeds uh, now are a green matter that will break down and feed your soil, like green manure, okay? So, so, uh, there may be uh, uh, some benefit then, but only if you do it early enough before they go to seed or before they are loaded with insects or diseases, etc. Question on what's the length of activity in soil for corn gluten meal? 
corn gluten meal, you'd lucky to get two or three months activity out of it, and you really have to apply it uh, uh, and incorporate it two or three weeks before you planting plant it. So it starts to rot and break down and become an herbicide. Because uh, uh, if you plant now and you add corn gluten meal immediately after, you are adding a fertilizer. And I've seen that, and I've seen that. So you really, you got to start with clone gluten meal two or three weeks in advance, uh, incorporate it, add water, let it break down. Then when you transplant, uh, then, uh, you know, then it might work. And if you want to use clone gluten meal, do not try to seed two or three weeks later because it can affect your seed germination. Okay. Question? Okay. So, uh, as you see, it's nine has nine percent nitrogen. Like I told you, it can act as a fertilizer unless you apply it, uh, uh, unless you apply it uh, early in advance. Give it time to rot, break down, decompose in the soil, and it becomes active as an herbicide. Question: As uh, corn gluten meal GMO, because eighty percent of the corn in the U.S. is GMO. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. If that bag is not specified, telling you that corn gluten meal is GMO free, then it could be it could come from corn that is GMO, uh, and uh, could be an issue. Of course, uh, um, so that's all I can say. Okay. Next slide is where's my mouse pointer. Next slide is weed barriers. Sometimes your best weed control management uh, for the homeowner or for the organic grower is a weed barrier. I told you uh, uh, cardboard. I told you newspaper is another example. But make sure you have 10, 12 uh, pages thick for it to be effective. Uh, it'll rot. It'll break down quick. Uh, but it's a physical barrier and it can stop a lot of weeds, uh, even nut sedge. Cardboard will even definitely stop nut, shed, nut sedge. Uh, garden fabric, which is, uh, is a wonderful product. I don't know why a lot of homeowners don't use it. If your raised bed is all transplants, why don't you cover the whole raised bed with the garden fabric, cut holes in it, put your transplant in, and put a thin layer of uh, you know mulch for decoration if you want to and that's an instant wheat free garden same idea as I mentioned with cardboard same idea okay uh, and the weed guard plus is basically a biodegradable uh, plastic uh, that you can use uh, as a weed barrier and it breaks down uh, a year later you can rototill it in uh, it's cellulose base, so a year later it breaks down and you can incorporate it and disappears. Okay. Boone, I'm going to mute you, Boone, because I keep getting uh, static. Okay, thank you. Okay, next slide is uh, here's an example of post emergent herbicides. I told you green match, I've tried green match. If you, when I tried it, if your weeds are not in the cotyledon stage or one to two inches tall, forget about being effective, because it's a burn down herbicide. You have to have wonderful coverage, uh, and uh, and uh, and uh, taller weeds. Uh, you know, you may burn them, but you may not kill them, and they'll continue come come back. Weed Zap, 20% vinegar, Burnout 2 are all example of products that can train citrus oil, clove oil, cinnamon oil, limonene, etc., etc., and they are only effective as a post-emergent herbicide. Question from Laura, what about screening as a cover? I don't know what you mean by that. Can you rephrase it, please? And while you're typing, I'm going to move on to the next slide. If you are not using a barrier, if you are not uh, using a uh, mulch, and uh, you have to deal with weeds, then the best time of weeding is when the weeds are one inch tall. If you let them get taller than one inches, you lost the battle. And if you do, you use a sharp hoe, 
So that's when sanitation and taking care of your tool. If you use a sharp hole or a glazer weed hole like this and you just scrub the sole surface, that's all the weeding you have to do. If you have to dig with your hole, that's not weeding and you lost the battle. The damage has already been done. If your weeds are six inches tall, forget if, uh, it's too late. So mechanical weed control. I, I hoed a garden that was 20 feet by 20 feet in 10 minutes because all I did is was scrape the soil surface when the weeds uh, were uh, very short, S scrape the soil surface with this glazer weed hole, the one you see in red here, in red, uh, and all. And basically, and I basically, I was just going back and forth, scrubbing the soil surface, and it was just time to walk up and down the rows, and I did it all. And that is, and I set back the weeds a uh, month, two months before they germinated again. So mechanical weeding is perfect, but you have to do it right. But honestly. I, I want to see on your raised beds, I don't want to see soil, I don't want to see weeds, use any kind of mulch, any kind of cover uh, to, uh, to reduce your water loss too. We're going to see more and more issues with water uh, uh, drought and issues and water shortages. So the cardboard, uh, the, the mulch, all this also reduce your water loss. Okay, Laura, what about screening for insect in exclusion? Screening, do you mean like the matted row cover? Uh, if you mean the matted row cover, then yes, uh, I told you, uh, I, and when I showed you the slide, I told you if you used, I said that if you use the matted row cover for a fall crop, in addition to the benefit of matted row cover uh, uh, reducing the stress of the heat on the plant, a second benefit is that it's a physical barrier from all the grasshoppers, the worms, the the pill bugs, the insects, the corn earworms, all of those uh, uh, crawling around and would love to eat your tender plants uh, uh, when you plant them. So yes. Okay, next slide. Uh, these are becoming more and more popular. They're flamers. Basically, you're using flame, a hot flame, to burn your weeds. If I were organic, I'm not going to in theory or in principle, I use this because I want to control weeds, but I'm adding all the uh, all the gas, uh, carbon dioxide back in the air. Uh, I'd rather use uh, hoeing, weeding, physical barrier, uh, uh, organic uh, you know, herbicides, uh, mulches, all those. But they are available. Uh, it's my duty to let you know of everything that's available. And here's one that. Oh yes, uh, there was an earlier question that is there any benefit to weeds to the soil? Uh, dandelion is an example that they are food for the honeybees and uh, they are edible as a wild crop. Well, if you are growing dandelion to eat from it, then it's not a weed because the definition of a weed is a useless plant. So if you want to grow dandelion, and there are varieties uh, of dandelion uh, that is uh, grown as an herb, then God bless, go do it. Uh, it's not a weed anymore. But if it's just sitting there attracting, uh, attracting, uh, uh, you know, uh, if it's just for the bees, there are other plants and uh, Okay, the question, which was the glazer hole look like? If you look at the picture, it is the one with the red handle. That's the one, that is wonderful. It is better than a regular hole because it can slide back and forth. Didn't use color. Okay, the one that, uh, the one that is, The how do I describe it, guys? The one that has like an opening, has an opening. All the rest are a solid piece of metal, and the only piece that you see a square hole in the center. Okay, some people call it uh, stirrup. Yes. Okay. So. Um, Mechanical, uh, here's another example of a tool 
I'm uh, now I'm on the slide showing you a tool that's basically it's just what I call grandpa's weeder, what they call grandpa's weeder or uh, Fiskar's uproot weeder. Basically, it, uh, these long spikes go right next to the dandelion or any deep-rooted weed, and it makes it easy to uh, pull uh, to lift it uh, standing up. Okay. Next slide is uh, probably the final slide in terms of uh, herbicide options, weed control options organically. I think your options, are, uh, the best one honestly is mulching. Plastic mulch is approved for organic production and it can come as uh, in the, uh, uh, the, the this, um, if you don't see the slide, the top, the top right picture is a type of plastic uh, that uh, that uh, can be <laughs> that can be approved organically biodegradable or not the circle is a picture of uh, is an example of a mat uh, that's maybe corn fiber or a fiber type material that you put around your tree or your bush and uh, as, as a physical barrier. And some of the uh, biodegradable mulch is available in cocoa fiber, uh, peat, mulch, etc. Question about what about biofumigant crops? Uh, biofumigant crops, uh, yes, that is an organic option. Uh, a biofumigant crop, for example, are the cabbage, coal crops, uh, all the coal crops. I like to see uh, a coal crop, cabbage, broccoli, cauliflower, Brussels sprout, in your rotation, uh, even if you don't like to eat them but only as a harvest them and give them to your neighbor. Uh, but as a biofumigant crop, basically after you harvest your cabbage or, uh, or if you don't want to harvest them, you don't like to eat them, even before they get too big and the stem too thick and too hard, chop it, cut it, uh, rototill it, uh, I mean mow it, rototill it in the ground, as it breaks down it releases uh, chemicals that uh, will k kill a lot of weeds, uh, germ germinating weeds. Yes, that's a good point. Uh, the, uh, I'm done with my presentation. I have here uh, some pictures of products that uh, are uh, uh, that I have at home, and just to show you, uh, uh, you know, um, give you some more example. Uh, if you uh, just to give you more hints and tips when you want to buy products this is an all season spray oil okay uh, so it's a horticultural uh, oil uh, because i see here this leaf simple uh, symbol even if it does not say for organic gardening just uh, because i see these three leaves i know that it is an organic product okay uh, to be uh, to be clear, uh, ideally this product here on the right, um, it says clearly Omri listed. Okay, so here is a a product that is spinosid, and uh, it's uh, Omri listed. Question uh, from Laura, rototilling create a hard pan, uh, yes it does, uh, I say rototilling, that's what comes to mind, uh, but if you want to use a fork and till your ground, that is fine. Uh, but uh, uh, on a raised bed, uh, that's, uh, the hard pan is not an issue uh, if you use a rototiller. Here's the Syncosin, the one I told you is an excellent product, uh, 32 ounces for about $22. Uh, uh, it's biologically derived agent for control of nematodes. If you have an issue of nematodes, uh, solar, solarizing is your first choice uh, if you don't want to spend uh, uh, on a chemical product to apply it. Okay, here is do I have that same picture twice? No. Here is BT worm killer. 
okay it has that leaf that leaf tells me that it is organic even though it doesn't clearly say that it is organic uh, what are the best methods of cleaning tools after use you uh, a wire brush to you to scrub all the dirt or use running water to remove all the excess dirt and all of this um, I use that uh, once in a while I sharpen it or I use uh, spray oil to keep it from rusting over the winter but just a wire brush or running uh, with and without running water to get rid of the dirt and wash it basically you want to remove excess some people have a mixture of 10 percent bleach 10% bleach bucket to that temp after they uh, wash off all the excess dirt they dip it in that 10% bleach uh, and the Clorox bleach basically uh, is disinfectant and then they hang it and of course once in a while you want to uh, uh, clean it and uh, spray oil on it so it doesn't rust okay here's a couple of examples of uh, fertilizers look at the formulation of that fertilizer it's three one and a half two okay and the liquid seaweed on the right is zero zero one it is more a compost more than a uh, fertilizer because you're not adding uh, any food here okay you're just adding potash uh, so uh, if you see an organic fertilizer that tells you it's 15 percent nitrogen it's fake it's been spiked with chemical fertilizer I have never seen any naturally occurring organic fertilizer uh, that's more than six or eight percent nine percent something like that uh, and which is the fish uh, emulsion uh, fish emulsion type fertilizers those are the highest uh, amount of nitrogen in them is it good to inject fertilizer or pest control beneath the soil um, inject fertilizer well inject fertilizer if you use drip irrigation that's basically injecting the fertilizer in the soil why not it uh, no problem uh, at what depth it doesn't really uh, matter because the fertilizer and or uh, the pesticide let's say an insecticide or fungicide will move with the water uh, so uh, I don't see depths as an issue if your drip irrigation is on the surface of the raised bed uh, when you water the fertilizer or the pest will move with the water what about companion planting system for beach border peach borders I uh, I don't know anything about uh, peach borders uh, sorry um, uh, I haven't worked with peaches uh, since I was in Kentucky and there I was not an organic uh, aficionado so I don't know anything about organic control options for peach borders uh, companion planting system to reduce pest uh, yes I gave an example of dill that repels insect when you plant it next to uh, tomatoes I think companion planting is a wonderful tool and if you type on the internet companion list of companion planting uh, yeah, you can find and actually I have a table if you email if you all email me later uh, remind me I will send you a, a list what I'm calling companion planting uh, one of the final slides here's an example of dipel and uh, organic choice uh, food concentrate and it's made by miracle grow so miracle uh, grow scott's company is moving into the um, uh, the uh, uh, organic market dipel dust uh, this is an example that i told you uh, it clearly says biological insecticide and here a little bit on the side uh, the, the leaves that clearly indicate to me it's organic option okay I am done with my slides I'm gonna continue answering questions sting bugs and leaf footed no I may have missed one strategies for dealing with sting bugs leaf footed bugs and squash vine borders 
Okay, organic options. In addition to the product that I listed here, uh, sometimes the best organic option is uh, trapping. Uh, uh, trapping. Uh, for example, uh, if you search online for stink bug light trap, and I did that, and I found a guy who built his own light trap, which is nothing but a container of uh, like a aluminum container. Everybody got this thing though. No, too different. Hello. Yes. So uh, the light the light trap basically it's a trap, and on the outside of that container he added a double-sided sticky tape. So all the sting bugs were attracted to the light at night and they got stuck on that tape and every day he removed the tape put a new layer so that's something that anybody can build okay email me later I'm, I'll, I'll send you the link to that uh, uh, or uh, show you pictures of how they build it uh, squash bugs there's a better option for squash vine borders squash vine borders they lay the eggs on the bottom side of the leaf. The eggs hatch and they crawl all the way down to the soil surface and they drill a hole and enter uh, the plant that way. So if you, want, if you have a small garden, you should be checking the bottom sides of the leaves. Flip the leaves, you know, take what it takes. You walk around and flip the, to look on the bottom side of the leaf takes you a couple of minutes to check your few plants that you have and if you see a mass of brown eggs crush them with your thumb and you have no squash uh, squash vine border problem at all without without having to spray anything uh, if you miss that window and you see a pinhole or a small hole on the bottom of the stem I know people that put a razor blade and cut parallel to the length of the stem and, and hoping that as they are cutting with the razor blade they are cutting through the worm and they kill it and a razor blade makes a nice sharp cut that it does not injure the plant and that the plant will heal. If that hole is big and you see frass coming out of that hole it's too late. That damage is done the best thing you can do is cut that plant and uh, cut it open uh, and kill that worm inside before it hatches um, and don't just uh, pull the plant and throw it in the trash because that worm will continue to feed. Uh, re remove the plant because it's useless, you lost the battle, you, you should know when to quit and but then still cut it open, cut that stem open to find that worm and kill it so it does not hatch, hatch and lay more eggs. So uh, one person told me I use my leaf blower that has a suction option. I turn the switch to make it suction and I go in the morning on a cool day morning uh, when they are or at night five o'clock in the morning when they're still lethargic and I and I suck them all in with my leaf blower uh, as a physical uh, trapping. So whatever works. Question from Laura, can cotton seed meal or soybean meal be GMO? Uh, it can be because there are GMO, soybean or cotton uh, varieties. So again, if you want to use uh, cotton seed meal or soybean meal, make sure you ask what's the source. Excuse me. <coughs> Same with rice hulls. Yes, rice hulls uh, um, can be, of course, in the Beaumont area. Rice hull, rice production. Uh, there are fee, there are more and more acreage of uh, organic rice. So if you take the rice hulls from that organic rice, you can be sure that the rice hulls is neither GMO or uh, had any pesticide, uh, unlabeled pesticide applied to it. For those of you who are not uh, against using regular pesticides, back to the question of sting bugs, leaf-footed uh, bugs, 
if you're not opposed to using insecticide, uh, I found that the combination of 7 and dimelin, dimelin uh, spells D-I, here I'm going to type it, so 7 plus dimelin mixed together is much more effective than, than either alone in control of leaf-footed bugs and, uh, and, uh, and sting bugs. If I were a homeowner and I absolutely don't want to spray anything, then I'll tell you, and you have a serious issue with these two, then I'll tell you uh, that uh, your best option is a net. There's research being done in more than one state on netting. So instead of a hot house or greenhouse or high tunnel, there are things that are now called net house, which is basically a big structure that has only a net over it. So you are using a physical barrier to stop anything on the outside, all the insects and from going in. And the net, uh, the net, uh, the net, what do you call it, the thickness or caliber can be big to stop birds or as small to stop uh, thrips, okay? The rate of dimelin in 7, uh, I, I'm sorry, I don't, don't know that off the top of my head. Boone, you have a question on spelling again, please, what do you mean? Oh, sorry, I typed it, but I did not press enter. <laughs> yes, here it is, I typed it, but I did not press enter. So here is dimelin and 7. Uh, Dr. Musabni. Yes, sir. And uh, and going back to, to some of the uh, the approved uh, organic sprays for uh, for, for leafwood bug, and I would agree we that is the one we've had a lot more problems with in the last year or two. Um, the pyre uh, the pyrethrins, we were kind of unclear with uh, the approvedness of doing the rotenone plus the the pyrethrin. Um, you might not be able to tank those together, but you could spray those applications on, you know, at the same time, separately. Uh, now, now, uh, let me be clear. If you buy a pre-mix formulation, it may not be organic. But if the label does not say do not mix, you can make your own mixture and spray them. Okay. Unless, unless the label clearly tell you do not mix with any other product. Uh, otherwise, you lose effectiveness. If it does that, then you can spray. So you can spray pyrethrin one day, and then uh, three days later, spray rotenone. You know, like if you're spraying on a 10-day cycle, then every five days you spray one or the other. Um, <laughs> so uh, instead of uh, instead of one after another, if you spray one after the other then you wash off the first one with the second one. You want to give it a day or two to dry out and be effective before you come with the I appreciate all your questions. I'm sorry for any technical difficulties. I encourage everybody to sign up uh, at uh, a half hour at least early uh, to fix any problems. Uh, okay, I had, a, I had a program with Kate Whitney. Uh, in Bosque County and we signed up an hour and we fixed all kind of technical problems so please let's keep that in mind for the future. Um, one last question, do anoles eat bad bugs? I'm sorry I don't know what anole is, anoles. What anoles? Green geckos? Uh, geckos will eat anything that can fit in their mouth. So, yes. Oh, Anolis, yes, the fast lizard. They scurry around real fast and they run around. Yes, I know now what they're called. Yes, yes, yes. They, uh, they eat anything. Uh, as a matter of fact, I'm glad you mentioned that. When I see them in my backyard garden, I know I have white flies because they are not going to be in my tomatoes just to uh, go for a picnic. Uh, they don't eat tomatoes. 
And then when I uh, then I start shaking the tomatoes and looking very closely, and I see one white fly, and I say, "Aha! Uh -huh, that's why they are there. They can smell them, they can see them. They so when I see the anoles, anoles, I'm sorry if I'm butchering the pronunciation, but when I see them, I know I have white flies in my tomato garden. So, and they eat them. What about the value of frogs? Frogs again eat insects, worms. Uh, but uh, I honestly don't know any value if it uh, if it'll do uh, if it'll do uh, has any serious benefit. Uh, how much do they eat? What do they you know? I don't know. Question about Roundup: Act as an endocrine disruptor even in humans? No idea. As far as I know. Uh, Roundup is, uh, if you use it properly, it's safe. I've had often, many times, Roundup spilled on my hands. I washed it, uh, didn't have any trouble. I, I'm losing my hair, but I don't think that's from the Roundup that I got on my hand uh, on multiple occasions. That's a joke, by the way. Uh, control of fig rust. No idea, Boone. I'm sorry. I'm not an expert on pesticides for uh, trees, fruit trees. Maybe that's a question for Monty or uh, or Jim Thomas. Or thank you all.